Okay. Hello and good evening and welcome to the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers monthly technical webinar for the month of April. This is a CPD event that is a continuous professional development event and carries a value of two CPD points. Please contact our secretariat to have your CPD information forwarded to you should you wish to claim those points for your various professional organizations. Some general housekeeping. Um, we will be introducing our panelists shortly, and we will have a presentation for about 40 minutes where we will have an interactive discussion amongst the panelists. At the end of that session, we will then be opening up the, the session to our guests, to sorry, to our audience to permit them to ask questions of our presenters. Um, the way we will do that is that you can either raise your hand and I will acknowledge you, or you can put your questions in the chat in case you may be a little camera shy. And in, on this particular occasion, if your question is to be directed at one of our panelists in particular, then I would ask that you just indicate which panelists you would like to refer that question to. Um, once you are not interacting, we ask that you will keep your device muted and your camera off so that we can ensure that we have some decent quality this evening. This afternoon, we will be looking at STEM education. What is STEM education and why it is important? Our panelists comprises of Mrs. Mrs. Nicola Leslie, uh, founder of Level Up, and she works in the um, computer IT sector. And she is a passionate, uh, very passionate about STEM. Uh, she was recently in the newspapers where she was expressing her passion. So on. good evening, Nicola. Good evening. Hi, and welcome. We also have Mr. Ian Drakes, no stranger to this um, forum. Uh, Mr. Drakes is the principal at the Samuel Jackman Prescott Institute of Technology. Mr. Drakes, you can bring out your camera. Good evening, sir. How are you? Good evening. I'm well, and you? Fantastic. And welcome again this evening. We also have on the panel uh, Mr. Robin Douglas, who is the acting principal of the Law School of Barbados. Good evening, Robin. Good evening, Vincent. Uh, I hope you're good. Yes, sir. And thank you for coming on this evening. I know you've had a, a challenging day and uh, certainly being uh, coming into the last, the ending of term, I know it, it's full of its own challenges. So thank you so much for joining us this evening, sir. Certainly. We also have on our panel this evening, Dr. Claire Durant, who is a lecturer at the University of the West Indies. Dr. Durant, how are you? Yes, good evening. I am well. Thank you. Thank you for coming on this evening. And last but certainly not least, uh, we are fortunate to be joined by Dr. Abbasad Dazi, who is joining us from Edinburgh, Scotland. And it is at this time, I believe, nine minutes past 11. Thank you very much, Dr. Dazi, for joining us. And how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm fine, thanks. Okay, so now that I've introduced my panel, I would ask you guys to... Um, I'm going to read your bios, and as I read your bios, I would just ask you to turn your camera on and just leave it on, and then we will start our interaction thereafter. Um, so, let me start where I started with Miss Nicola Leslie. Nicola is an innovative and transformative analytics leader in the IT industry for over 16 years with experience that spans both the public and private sector and across various technology disciplines. Nicola's current focus is the development of the data analytics and the data governance practices at leading regional financial institution. Nicola holds a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and Mathematics with first class honors from the University of the West Indies and a Master's of Science in Operational Research from the University of Strathclyde in Scotland. I didn't realize that, that you were up our side, um, Nicola. Fantastic, good stuff. All right. Um, over the last 11 years, Nicola have been in the data trenches and proud to see the evolution of the firm's data strategy and the democratization of data and analytical platforms. 
She's very passionate about making data accessible and advancing data as a second language to everyone. Over the last five years, she has led the data analytics community with more than 250 um, individuals trained in analytics. Nicola's mission is empowering users with the tools and processes to engage with their data in a whole new and meaningful way. Another passion of Nicola is the advancement of women in STEM. She is the founder of Level Up, a community for women in technology with goals for women to aspire to leadership, constantly challenging themselves and closing the gap between their aspirations and the practical knowledge needed in the fast-paced world. When Nicola is not working on data issues, she is busy raising her son, a future data creative. Welcome again, Nicola, and thank you for being a part of our panel. Thank you. Our next uh, panelist this evening is Mr. Ian Drakes. Uh, Mr. Drakes has an outstanding career in Barbadian education, which spans over three decades um, in the fields of special education and technical and vocation education and training. His teaching career began in 1987 in composite and special needs schools. His specialty areas include physical education, mathematics, social studies, and technical education programs. He uses educational prowess um, and go-getting attitude to ensure that the students not only excelled in the classroom, but were able to matriculate to the Samuel Jackman Prescott Polytechnic, as it was known then, um, the Barbados Vocational Training Board and the Barbados Youth Service. Mr. Drakes also has a passion for agriculture and was involved in various clubs related to this industry in Barbados. This passion for the vet and agriculture prompted him to establish and coordinate several extracurricular activities such as the Forage Club, an agricultural science day release program, and a program called Pipe Fine Furniture. As a strong believer in lifelong learning, Mr. Drakes went on to gain a Bachelor's of Education in Technical and Vocational Education from the Barbados Community College, graduated with upper second class honors and a certificate in educational management and admission administration sorry, from the University of the West Indies Cayfield campus. He used these qualifications to transition from the classroom setting, taking up an administrative role as the curriculum development industrial liaison officer at the Samuel Jackman Prescott Polytechnic. Having functioned in that capacity for one year, Mr. Drake's passion and drive saw him gaining a promotion to the role of deputy principal of administration and during that time, he gained a Master's of Science in Education and in Educational Leadership and Administration um, from Wilden University. And five years after functioning in the capacity of deputy, he was promoted to principal and the renamed Samuel Jackman Prescott Institute of Technology. Mr. Drakes has continued his professional development areas such as leadership training for management, technical vacation institutions, and human resources management development. Um, to name a few is, um, right, so that, that is, sorry, Mr. Drake, sorry. that's um, Ian Drakes, and thank you very much for being on with us this afternoon. Most welcome, sir. Mr. Robin Douglas. Mr. Douglas is the principal acting of the Lord's School of Barbados and has served in that role for the past three and a half years. He holds a BSc in biology, an MED in curriculum theory, planning and practice, and a postgraduate diplomas in education and educational leadership, all from the University of the West Indies. A scientifically driven man with critical thinking as a benchmark of his approach to life, Mr. Douglas has long been fascinated by the opportunities possible within education to effect change in a society. At age 19, he became inspired by the idea of nation building through education and embarked on a journey of learning and service within the profession some four years later. During his 24 years of devotion to the craft, he has held professional positions of head of Department of Biology at Harson College and deputy principal at Princess Margaret Secondary School, where he was the youngest to hold that position in the nation. He has been a secondary school timetabler for 15 years of his tenure in education and committed himself to leadership positions such as uh, Prefect Master and Students Council faculty advisor during the years. Ever aware of the importance of student voice in developing leaders in our society, he has intensely contributed to the development of curriculum in the science field at his professional postings 
and continues to see the future of education through the lens of data-driven, critically considered decision-making, all for the betterment of the nation and the world. A lover of Kool-Aid, strategy games, and great conversation, uh, definitely a pleasant welcome to Mr. Robin Douglas. Thank you for joining us, sir. You're welcome. Dr. Claire Jurett uh, was awarded her doctorate in philosophy in biology from Imperial College of Science and Technology and Medicine, London, as a Commonwealth scholar. She holds a master's in project management and evaluation from the UWI Cave Hill. Dr. Jurent has 20 years experience in consultancy work and in the management and monitoring of Caribbean development and research projects with focus on rural development, climate smart agriculture, food and nutrition, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. She's currently a project developmental specialist with the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center. Dr. Jurent is a science education expert for Macmillan Publishers, author of the textbook Biology for Cape Examinations for Macmillan, and judge for the Macmillan Caribbean Young Environmental Scientist of the Year for 2023. Dr. Jurent is also a winner in 2021 and 2022 of the Royal Society of Chemistry's Inclusion and Diversity Fund Award for Youth Projects. Dr. Jurent, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much. And last but not least, um, this evening, we are happy to have joining us from Edinburgh, Scotland, Dr. Abbasa Dazi. Um, Dr. Abbasa sees um, herself uh, working at the intersection between data science and business analysis, often serving as a bridge between technology and domain experts. She uses visualization guided exploratory analysis to translate non technical requirements and complex conceptual problems to design and evaluation of tools that increase insight during question answering, problem solving, and decision making. One of the projects she works on is measuring gender differences in subject choice at secondary school in Scotland, with a focus on the gap in technology overall, and especially computer science, to feed into policy at government level on a growing tech sector. Uh, Dr. Dazi uh, would be responsible or have been um, involved in I believe it is some 50 plus academic journals um, and she has worked at several um, academic institutions throughout the United Kingdom and in Ghana. And a very warm welcome to you, Dr. Dazi, and I appreciate you sacrificing your time, given that it is a five hour difference between here and there. And though we can do absolutely nothing about the horrid weather in Scotland, we give you a warm Barbadian welcome this evening. Thank you. Good to see you. Good. Guys, we are here to talk about STEM and to pull upon your experiences and your thoughts and to uh, have a general discussion this evening and by so doing, um, spur some ideas and perhaps um, create some synergies and create some new friendships. I will now ask you, uh, as I call your name, just to give us your insights and your thoughts into the topic of STEM and what it means to you. So we'll start with you, Nicola. Sure, you can hear me okay. Yes, I can hear you fine. Great. Yeah, so when I was thinking about the title, right, the importance of STEM education, um, well, first of all, I should say that a quote, quote came to mind. So I came across this quote. Um, I want to make sure I, I capture it correctly. Um, so, Nicola, sorry. Yeah. Let me across you. Can you pull your mic a little closer? It's kind of sure. coming a little bit. Yeah. No problem. Is that better? Okay. Let's, better? Yeah, let's go again. Keep going. Okay. So when I looked, um, I came across a quote when I was thinking about, and you know, what am I going to speak about today? I might have three minutes. And I came across this quote, education is our passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to the people who prepare for it today. So that is a quote from Malcolm X. And right. I thought about it and I said it so resonated with me. Um, one, because, you know, 
like drive on value education. And in, in a sense, it is of essence that it's something, STEM education in particular, is something that um, has to be important and for me has to be a priority, right? So it's no doubt as important, but it must be a priority. But I thought about that one because of us being Barbados, um, being Barbadians, and being what we call, what we are known in some in some um, circles as being a small island developing state. And it really came to mind um, when I think back during the pandemic, and that there were certain things that we couldn't get because um, we didn't have access to them. And I, and I asked myself, we, you know, we are no, no less more than the rest of our um, our counterparts overseas. Do we have, have we invested in the STEM education to build and train our talent to be more um, able to withstand some of the challenges that we face as a small island state, right? Um, I also thought about the importance of, of STEM education also from an economic economic opportunity, you know, I can't remember which palace, but I know one of them does have, have a focus on agriculture. So I thought about the fact we can't do the same thing that we've been doing all the time. And something where we keep talking, there's always in, in one of the things that is a national conversation right now is around food security. So something like agriculture and our investments how do we go about educating our young people to get the best returns, knowing that we can't go far with the, um, for lack of a better term, the simple plantation model, right? So, you know, there are so many things that is, is ever so important. Um, There's so many factors that we in the Caribbean have to think of. Um, do we realize the, the role that STEM education plays, um, you know, um, and and the last comment I would make, my for the three minutes, but the last comment I would make uh, when I thought about the priority of, of the importance of STEM education would also be the readiness of the workforce. So, <laughs> as I said, a lot of people on this panel, they they in and they out um, are training the 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 minds, the young minds. And it is ever so important to me, especially when I, I also have to interact with new young talent coming into the workforce, um, that STEM education must focus and must, um, we must encourage thinking outside the box. Um, <laughs> what some people say, not even thinking that there is a box, but we have to have critical thinking we must, um, our STEM education must ready the workforce and also enable the next generation of innovators. So, you know, I do think that's what we need to sustain our economy to um, go beyond the old way of doing things. And I mean that as in um, what is going to help sustain the, the Caribbean, but Barbados in particular. Um, and it does boil down to, um, to the STEM education and the priority that is given uh, as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Nicola. Um, when you come back on, just I think we need to pull that mic a little closer because I'm still getting a little miss ah. going missing. So thanks very much for your intro. Okay. Uh, Mr. Drix. Sir. You get to go next, sir. You're next Thank you, okay. sir. Right. Um, for me, I see Tibet and STEM working together. And as I thought of this presentation, it, to me, it is easy to apply STEM competencies and skills to the technical and vocational education and training, as the hallmark of both is a heavy focus on innovation and problem solving. Besides is the fact that many problems explained by those in the industry require resolution, does require the addition of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM. Said 2021 expressed the pivotal relationship between the two, exhorting the STEM is integral in the knowledge 
and integration of the new 21st century Tibet skills needed in the industry. According to Supers, Kohler and Helen, 2009, STEM education is an interdisciplinary approach to learning where rigorous academic concepts are coupled with real world lessons as students apply science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the context that make connections between school, community, work, and the global enterprise. But why stop though just the application of STEM? You know, I would have hinted to you. I want to add that to this and suggest the application of STEAM, adding arts as a contender for problem solving. A study by Bissella and Joseph 2022 revealed that the arts help individuals to develop skill in the use of handling tools as a language of communication. It allows us to cross barriers where the verbal may not be possible. It allows people to think outside of the norm when looking for solutions to complex problems. It sustains the development of profound knowledge within the various TVET disciplines. The Academia magazine highlighted 10 benefits of art education. One, it helps people develop skills such as resilience, determination, and a growth mindset. Two, encourages individuals to take risks and foster confidence as there really is no set outcome so they do not feel the pressure that comes with the idea of failure. Three, it helps individuals to embrace different thought processes and accept that there are various ways to reach a particular result. Four, it fosters concentration and persistence. Five, it strengthens decision-making and critical thinking skills. Six, it helps individuals to develop unique and powerful ways of understanding and knowing and representing and interpreting the world. Seven, it facilitates collaboration. Eight, increase student engagement as it is largely student-centric. Nine, fosters positive cultural culture by instilling positive attitudes and habits and three and 10 sorry enhances creativity imagine if you would that you are a baker and you're hired to create a tear tear pie with multiple flavors think about the consideration that must be given as to which pie crust will be the most stable how to do the pie to have stacks to maintain structure and beauty of which flavor must be complemented they must complement each other. Consider that Barbados has a rich and diverse culture, but we also have a dying art such as basketry and furniture making. Can we not preserve and improve these arts and export them to foreign countries to gain money to boost the economy? This is why I believe that although STEM is extremely useful in Tibet and its growth, the addition of art can instill the requisite acumen to the TV life are in leaps and bounds. And I just want to add, sir, that only in today's nation, investing on page three, investing in arts as a path for the youth prime is a wonderful article which really substantiates what I have just said about adding the arts and also architecture, sir. That's awesome. my thoughts for now. All right, Mr. Dritz, thank you so much. And we are going to mix it up now. So I'm going to ask um, Abasa to give us your thoughts on STEM. Actually, before I go on to what I'd meant to talk about, um, I'd just like to comment on um, STEAM. So I actually worked on a project a few years ago where that was the goal. And it was looking at developing countries. So it's down south in England. And it was looking at the fact that in most developing countries, actually, student uptake of uh, STEM subjects is actually dropping because there is lower interest, it's seen as not cool, etc. And STEAM was actually one of the ways to try to encourage uptake. So in the project I worked on, they were actively using drama as a part of teaching um, STEM. And we actually had a session where we had all of um, GCSE students and um, getting ready to take their exams. And then right just after they'd taken their exams, we went through them learning about Avogadro's constant. 
And if he's using play acting, if he's using drama, and we actually filmed sessions where they were building sets, they were building sets to demonstrate how they learned about Avogadro's constant. And they filmed, they made little films out of it. And it was actually really interesting to see the kids' enthusiasm because it wasn't just somebody uh, going on about a really boring huge number and trying to get the facts in their head. It was them actually actively constructing that knowledge and you could see the process and how well it worked with them. And in um, collecting some of the comments from the kids afterward, I learned one really useful word and somebody actually described the whole process as awesome source, which I hadn't heard before, but I thought that was actually a really brilliant way to show you that that approach actually does work in getting people interested in science, getting people interested in the different STEM subjects. So I can confirm I have actively seen it work in that was really good. So jumping back to what I'd initially wanted to use as my introduction, um, I remember uh, when I was in primary school, where I went to primary school, it was Burkina Faso at that point, who was the third poorest country in the world. And I remember seeing some of the local kids who came from families that didn't have any disposable income. So obviously, them getting toys from Toys R Us or Lego or some other thing that was built for them wasn't going to happen. However, they made their own toys. And I remember seeing amazingly crafted cars and trucks. And essentially, they were using stuff that have gone onto the tip. So they're using empty tin cans, pieces of wire. And these were beautifully built. They worked. They moved. They could take a stick and push the cars. The only thing missing was they didn't have the pieces to construct an engine so they could use a radio. But those cars worked as well as a 20 pound truck that would have been bought for somebody with money to throw away in Toys R Us or some other place. And these kids weren't being trained to do it. They didn't have access to very good schools, but they had creativity. They, had, they were very innovative because they had to find a way to create their toys and they did it. And I remember thinking back to those and thinking those would have made amazing engineers but did they ever have the opportunity to do it? And in their countries, when it comes to building a new bridge or building some other major infrastructure, they don't turn to these kids who would have done absolutely amazing work because they probably never got the opportunity to make it even to through to the end of secondary, let alone college or university. But they would have gone off to a developed country to go get the skill, the people who know to come in and build infrastructure in a place where they don't understand how things work. So a lot of these things would cost the countries even more money, which means these kids would have even less opportunity to learn and build, but they don't have the context in which, uh, which these kids would have, which would have meant that you'd end up with better processes, you'd have things that work for the environment. So I look back at stuff like that and you think of the kind of opportunity that is lost simply because they didn't have the education that would have taken that creativity to their innovation the intelligence that these kids showed that a lot of the time is wasted. And I think it's a great shame that being able to harness that, um, I would like to see one of these kids, what they would have been able to build, looking at something like where if we've got the fourth bridge, which is um, a structure, it's, it, I believe it is a UNESCO structure. They talk about, I've seen articles on it, I've watched movies on it that talk about it's built on uh, uh, the design is similar to the backbone of a um, large animal and you actually look at it. So the last time I was there, I actually took a look and I thought, okay, I can get where they're talking about all of that and why it worked and they're building on lessons from previous bridge further up in, in the country, New Dundee, the Tay Bridge that collapsed and learning from all of these. And you think, if you took these kids and they had the same kind of education, what could they build in their countries for a lot less, much better, that would work for their environment? Fantastic. That's uh, certainly interesting. And I, I'm sure Mr. Dritz is happy that he has an ally this evening. <laughs> Robin, I'm coming to you. As I said, we're mixing up a little bit. Um, so let's hear your thoughts on STEM. Obviously, you have the background as a teacher before you be became a principal. So let's hear your um, thoughts, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> I've considered this topic 
And um, it's resonated with quite a bit of the experiences you said that I've had through the years. Uh, STEM um, uh, education has had its um, detractors. There are those who are, con are concerned about the um, lack of uh, gender equality sometimes in STEM education, because we see um, that girls are not always, uh, women are not always represented um, um, proportionally. And we know of um, there are other, other detractors that would have would consider that focusing on STEM education can sometimes um, be a bit myopic or um, tunnel visioned, and that more rounded students who understand um, the social ills and, and, and life would be better citizens. However, I would say that if uh, we are to look at the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, produced in 2015, and the ideas about getting reaching them by 2030, that include things like re removing poverty and having good health and well-being and so on, that having uh, students who can critically analyze information um, definitely helps us move towards those goals. And talking about information, I, I talked about this because in this modern age, disinformation, misinformation is one of our greatest difficulties for young minds. I mean, old minds as well, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, the social media platforms um, have allowed us to have um, unfettered connectivity across the world, but they've also brought um, nefarious characters within our homes um, to teach our children and even ourselves things that don't exist for the sake of whatever agenda these persons have. Now, how do we produce citizens then that can continue to move an entire society forward um, so that they can uh, buffet away the ills of the misinformation? Um, it is my perspective that we need to um, push for STEM education from as early as possible. Children need to be taught to, to learn to think. They have to be able to think from as early as two and three and four years old. Uh, it is not just about starting it early and centering ideas like around the scientific method, which is about critically assessing. I mean, that's often a buzzword about critical thought. What is it really? Being able to receive information, think about it carefully, weigh it against other pieces of information? Does it fit with what we've learned about the nature of the universe? So it isn't only about introducing these concepts as early as possible so that we produce citizens who can think about things um, in an objective way, but it is also about the way in which we teach it. Uh, uh, um, our last panelist spoke about um, constructive ways of teaching. One of the difficulties in science teaching is that we often get caught up in uh, delivering information and facts, as opposed to having children discover the science as we go, right? And I have seen it for myself, how discovery of science and discovery of things that builds greater understanding and ability at thought in our students. Um, I hear the beeping, so I know that my three minutes is um, over, but I'm going to end by saying that, um, indeed, uh, Maybe, maybe a slightly controversial idea, but 57.2% of the Barbadian population were vaccinated with the COVID vaccine during um, the, the pandemic. And we wonder about how that amount, that percentage is related to the blind accept acceptance of misinformation or incorrect interpretations of raw data that would have skewed towards persons' biases and so on. So I think that education has a very strong part to play in trying to produce citizens that can clearly assess information, think about their own biases, and come up with the correct things as we move forward. Thank you. OK, thanks for that, Robin. Dr. Duran. Yes, please. Yes, good evening. Well, I am going to come at it from a practical perspective. The majority of students who are, you know, in school, you know, in secondary school or in community college here um, in Barbados, presenting, you know, science is normally done in a very dry way. And in order to get students interested in science and technology, it is important to present the subject in a really fun and interactive way so that students can see that science um, is really underpinning all of the activities that they are doing every day. 
I will speak specifically about chemistry because that is my area and that is an area where I have been really working with students. When you explain to students that some of the things that they use every day, you know, the computer, um, the laptop, the, the toothpaste, all of those things have been engineered by chemists. They contain different types of materials, they contain different types of minerals, and then you give them the opportunity to see how they can have a hands-on activity, then it brings the, the subject to life. Um, chemistry and you know biology and a lot of the science subjects are really taught in a very dry fashion and bringing it so that the students themselves because you know young people from you know in the teenage years that's when they form their ideas about what careers and what areas they want to be involved in so it is important from in order to get students interested and not just thinking of okay, I have to pass a particular subject. How can I really become interested in this particular you know, area and really do it in a practical way and let students interact? And in that way, they really find that science is something that they want to be involved in and that they want to say, okay, this is not something that is boring. This is something that I want to be involved in. With regard to things like social media use, um, computer use, gaming use, I always say to students, there was no such thing as WhatsApp. There was no such thing as this cell phone that we use now when I was a child. You are sitting there and you are using social media, you are using apps, you are gaming because that is your favorite activity. You should be thinking about how you can create the next WhatsApp. You should be thinking about how can you create the next Minecraft and Black Hawk Down and the next Spider-Man um, Super Something. That's what you should be thinking of. And that goes to understanding how things work in the background and not just be users and consumers of things. This is science. This is understanding how these things work in the background. And this is where you get students interested in how things were and how they can participate in science. Climate change is the biggest threat facing the world now. How are scientists going to actually address those challenges from a chemistry, biology you know, perspective? It is important to bring these things to life and then students will say, oh, maybe that's an area that I want to be um, involved in and really do it from a practical um, perspective. So those are my thoughts on the STEM education. Thank you so much everyone for your um, thoughts and that sets us up nicely to get going. Now I was looking at a, a journal that was prepared in 20, April 2016, University of the West Indies and the, the particular paper is called Getting STEM Right from the Start, Using the Project Approach in Early Childhood Settings. And this was by Sab Sabrina Ha, Abdul Mahajid, and Sandra Figaro Henry. And this, is, this was done at the St. Augustine campus in Trinidad. Uh, in that research, um, they were talking about benefits to students and highly motivated students. And they said at one center where students were learning about diseases spread by mosquitoes and how to prevent mosquito breeding grounds, Ms. Prudent said, Michaela would say every week, Auntie, what are we going to do in STEM today? Now, when you look at that little face, you can't just say, okay, I'm not doing anything. You know, she was one of the motivators for me. That's what helped me along. And then there was another one, um, of talking about the enthusiasm to another level when uh, Miss Tam said, and then the children's motivation level, it was like, oh my gosh, Miss Tam, what are we, what are we going um, to do today? And we going to make the machine today? And you know, they want to do it. And the level of interest really pushed me forward to finish the project. 
and I heard what everyone said. Well, so three persons, um, or rather four persons, spoke about per students getting involved, the approach and the teaching methodology that is being used. Now, when I was at school, I, I, I would subscribe to what you said, Dr. Jurek, that um, the teaching of the sciences was rather dry. And that's me being very kind to any other professionals who might be in here. Uh, my question is, how do we get our teaching style, uh, particularly in the West Indies, um, in the diaspora, how do we get our teaching style to the point where our students want to become involved? And I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask Robin to start with a reply, and then I'll, I'll direct the question accordingly. So Robin, you are at the sharp end, as it were. Um, what are your thoughts on this? How do we adjust our teaching style to get students involved? Certainly. We, we need to do as I heard you say. Um, students need to be given the opportunity to discover knowledge. And this is a, this is a, um, a, a known concept within um, education fields in terms of instruction type. Um, we need to have a constructivist approach so that students are presented with an opportunity to discover things. And that can be that can be molded and, and, and guided towards the things that you want students to learn. Um, I, I have had experience with this myself as a teacher in the, in the, in the, in the science lab and so on. Um, and it is wonderful to see the way in which students' eyes can light up so that instead of giving students a table with a list of gases and the positive responses that you get based on tests that you can do for those gases, you give them an opportunity to simply explore the way in which various re uh, reagents and so on respond to the gases and create their own list of positive tests. It is that kind of education, and that's a very simple example, right? Um, but it is that way of approaching science learning that is extremely important, um, giving students an opportunity to see uh, as um, Dr. Durant would have said, see the way in which science is evident in every single aspect of ourselves, understanding that nature, science is really truly an explanation of nature at work. Um, so teachers have to do it in that way, but the difficulty, the challenges are numerous. The reality is that um, though teachers will be encouraged to um, approach things in a constructivist way, we have several other factors at work. And one of them is the deadlines, are the deadlines um, for the tests and the various um, uh, certificates that we are moving towards. There is a certain amount of time to get syllabus coverage done. Um, there are examinations to be done for various bodies at the end of specific times. And one of the difficulties that you have with this type of teaching is that it takes a little more time. Time is needed for us to allow the students to explore and discover, guided, of course, and for us to consolidate that information as syllabuses would need. I, I sometimes consider that um, curriculum reform in terms of what it is that you want students to be able to produce at the end of a particular period of time for a particular syllabus exam, et cetera, is needed. If, to, if teachers are to be encouraged to spend the time to develop the type of lessons that will encourage that kind of thought and exploration so that we, there wouldn't be the hurried and hurried uh, experience of getting SBAs finished and getting syllabuses finished and so on and so on. So there are challenges to it, but essentially those are the kind of things that we can do. I believe me, I can regale you with many a story of st students in my classes you know, having a, an amazing time discovering information. So that is what, where I would leave it at the moment. Okay, great. Now, Dr. Durant, you have a pretty interactive um, session. You had it, I think, this year, and you've had it two previous years. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you told me earlier that parents have been calling you and asking you if you're going to have summer sessions. So are you seeing the approach that you have engendered in your programs? That that um, approach of self-discovery almost as the way forward, not only for STEM, but certainly for our education and way we approach our teaching, uh, particularly here. Yes, I would, I would certainly say that. The last activity that I had in, um, in 2022, we presented chemistry from the perspective of beauty, tattoos, and technology. 
when the students came to, you know, they said, well, we don't know what, what does beauty and tattoos and technology have to do with chemistry? What it, does it have to do with science? You know, all those beauty products are not um, just like that. They are put together in specific ways to have a particular outcome. The inks that they use, you know, in order to make all of those pretty colors and stay underneath your skin, those are produced by chemists. So the students were like, okay, I did I never thought that chemistry or biology had anything to do with some of these things that we are using every day. The things that the ladies use, the gels and the edge control and the mascara, those are not the same products from 50, even five years ago. The gel nail polish, it is something that has been generated now that is different. So the thing is that we have to be able to bring the students into a place where they are seeing the science come to life. And I know that, yes, we have to get through with the syllabuses and, you know, the students have the fixed SBAs, but what we need is, you know, support for teachers or guiding them so that they know there are easy ways in order to teach. Sometimes teaching chemistry or biology can be expensive if everything has to be imported, you know, or you say, well, okay, I have to use a, a specific um, machine or a specific apparatus. But I will give you an example. You know, water potential is something that we teach in chemistry and biology. And you can buy a, you know, apparatus to show this. But you can also do it by doing something like, you know, we all love coleslaw and it is something that, you know, we eat, you know, all the time. And if you grate a cabbage and carrot and you put sugar on it, it makes the water come out of the cells outside because sugar is outside and that is more, that is where it is highly concentrated. Using things like that is a way to teach water potential. But the teachers have to be supported, sometimes presented in new ways to use regular things that they can use to teach the subject. So it's all about making it practical and trying to, you know, come at it, you know, like, as we say, from outside the box to use, you know, cheap and available things in order to teach um, the subject and really get the students excited. Yeah, thanks for that. Now, Mr. Drakes, you are very much in charge of an institution, uh, technical vocational, where the approach is usually a hands-on approach, but are there different ways or more innovative ways of, of, of doing or teaching even within your environment, sir? What are your, what are your comments in this regard? Um, well, there could be different ways and there are different ways, but I, I want to strongly support what the panelists have said so far and especially um, Dr. Joan, because that's the first thought that came to mind when you asked about how can we um, get the students change? And I believe that what is needed and what I've been seeing and I have done much research on leadership, but, and I emphasize empowerment. And, and, and Dr. June said it just now in terms of assisting the instructors, but well, I talk to the instructors, more so to help them to show them different ways. And therefore, when they are developed professionally, you will find that they will produce a different type of student because they start thinking of what type of student I really want to, put up there, what type of person, what, and, 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 and for me, the thought process is, the old adage used to be to get a job. Now we talk about not just getting a job, but working for yourself. And, and I would say that not only myself, but my sister, Institutional Community College, does a wonderful job of alternative when it comes to sciences that Dr. June was talking about, in terms of the whole aspect of cosmetology, and, and using indigenous materials in Barbados. And, and, and I think that's what Dr. Jewett is saying, that if we can now give the instructors that type of alternative way of doing things, that you don't have to get it from China, it can get it from Welch Mahal Gali. And, and, and using our environment, to, to, environment to, to really assist us and then showing the integration. What we have seen at SJPI is applied where uh, those chemistries that you talk about, Dr. Durant, you, you relate it to baking, to food, and, and let them understand that this is chemistry. And if you put the wrong thing, then it's, it's serious because your person's life is at risk. 
if you make the wrong combination, the, the oops, I'm sorry, can't work. So that I am saying that all of that to me is what enhances how we will deliver to our new citizens. I say new citizens because that's what they are. And using our indigenous material, as I said, BCC does a wonderful job of soaps. We are going along that line as well at the SJPI and, and then teaching them how to market these things after you've done all of that. And, and I'm seeing it more when you go to shows nowadays, um, even the wines, um, BVTV does wines you know, with the fruits along, along that line. So that we are teaching from what we have. We're not saying, oh, well, you have to do a French wine when you're doing home economics. We, we have um, five finger that we call five finger. You can use that in your home economics. And, and so to me that that will reinforce and still get the sciences, still get your SBA and still meeting the deadlines. Okay. Um, Abba, sir, can you give us uh, two perspectives? The perspective from you having gone through a system on continental Africa and then the perspective from being a instructor, tutor, lecturer at the university level in the UK as to the approaches you, you, you see and the approaches that you see that work best for our young people. Right, so if I go back to, I did secondary school in Ghana and uh, when you do secondary school, you're required to do, um, well, you used to be, I don't know if it still happens, you used to be required to do a year's national service because in sec four and your fees, um, everything was paid for. So it was a way of giving back, well, it's a bit more complex as a way of giving back and um, having got your education for free for the sixth form. And I was assigned to a science center in a small village, just that it was a village or a town, not too far from the capital. And essentially that was built to provide practical exercises for the sciences in the four secondary schools in the village. So they were getting in class, the textbook teachers talking at them about the different subjects, but they didn't have labs, so they weren't getting the practical side of it. So that center was set up so that they could actually get the lab exercises done. The only problem being that the center was essentially four empty rooms. Um, and well, it was actually, sorry, that's actually incorrect. The four, the four schools came to the center. We had one empty room at the back of one of the class, uh, the schools, and that was the lab with nothing in it. And in this case, we needed to have practical exercises. And there, that was where we needed to look at what was in the environment, because they didn't have any money to fund buying things from all the equipment you needed, et cetera. So using actually chemistry as an example, we needed Bunsen burners and we needed gas to go through them. We needed test tubes to be able to carry out the different experiments. I think there were three small test tubes. There were definitely no Bunsen burners. There was no gas. There was nothing else. So what we ended up doing was actually looking at, if you go to the night market, what they have for candles, they have a little tin can and it's got kerosene in it and there's a wick. And they like that and that gives them the light. And we thought there's our Bunsen burner. So that's exactly what we did. And the kids, and that was useful in that, again, it was asking the kids to be innovative. You haven't got what you need. So said, we're not going to import it from China or the US or whatever, because you haven't got the money for it. And um, what have you got in the environment that you know already works and do exactly what we need to get our buns and burner in order to carry out the experiment? And that's what we built in the classrooms and the kids got their, their chemistry labs done. But what they gained from that, apart from actually seeing all the different things come together and not just reading from the text, but actually seeing it work, was we can actually be innovative. How do we get our science to work in our circumstances? We've got constrained, we've got constrained circumstances, but we can get it to work. Their experience was the same as a kid that was on their way to Harvard who has a trust fund, because they learned exactly what that kid would have done for a lot less money in an environment where they were taught to be creative, that kid who went to Harvard would not have been able to come anything close to that because everything is done for them. And one of the things there is sometimes having constrained circumstances actually can be useful because people start to be a lot more innovative. They start to make use of the things around them. So instead of 
taken all those cans and put them in the rubbish heap. We actually use them. So that's gone back to upcycling, recycling. You've got yet another lesson the kids were learning there. And actually talking about that, the kids in the capital, in the rich schools, wouldn't have learned those lessons because they would have had proper labs. So you've got that situation where actually the people who are a bit, the people are actually disadvantaged. In a way, if you take control of the learning they do and the constructive knowledge, actually do learn a lot more and start to think a bit more about, well, I haven't got what I need. What have I got around me that I can adapt to do what I want to do? And those are your engineers of the future. So I skipped forward to during COVID, I was actually in an organisation I volunteer with and so Hibs is one of the, is the football club in Edinburgh and they have a um, science fair during the summer where they kept kids and I believe mostly primary and early secondary in. But with lockdown, they couldn't physically go in. So actually the advantage there was they could open up to kids outside of Edinburgh and they had a wider uh, variety of kids coming in. And one of the sessions that I volunteered for, I said I wanted to do something with data. So they got the historian of the club and they said, well, he's got a fair bit of data sitting about, they don't know what to do with it. So I spoke to him and he was a great storyteller. So he walked me through the so roughly 100 years of Hibs games and the Scottish Football League, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I find football about as interesting as watching paint dry. But he was such a great storyteller. I was completely engaged. And he was telling the story from his interest of football. And then I was given the data. So I had that story he'd been telling and I had the dry data and I had to set up a 40 minute session for was it seven to 10 year olds where they'd be engaged. They were coming online, they weren't physically there. So essentially what I did was to take some of his stories and I found some of the interesting things, what happens around New Year's because it's a special gala. When Hibs have done better than Celtic and Rangers, and I'm quite sure everybody in the world knows at least Celtic and Rangers is nothing else but football in Scotland. And kind of the, when does HIPS do well? When do they not do well? And trying to take that data and relate those stories to the kids in ways that would be interesting to them, that would keep them engaged. And a lot of it was looking at, well, am I looking at colors? Am I looking at what types of charts? What will actually tell those stories with the data and get them engaged in how they could work as data analysts, how they could see how that would be applied to football for those who were Hibs fans or some of the other fans of the other clubs, where they could see where they could see their clubs were doing better than Hibs or Hibs was doing better than them over time. And one simple example I used was looking at where Hibs had won and where Hibs had lost, starting to use different colours to show it. And I had three colours, basically red, yellow and green. And it was when they were losing, it was at the red end. Where they were winning, it was the green end. And I basically just showed that to the kids. And I said, how do you interpret that? And one of the boys will just probably said, those are the traffic lights. And I thought, brilliant. That's exactly what I wanted to see. Then taking an example in real life and using that to interpret the fact that red means stop. There are things going wrong or there's danger or we're not too happy. Green means go, you want to go on and do things. So aligning the wings with the green, aligning the losses with the reds and uh, in where they had a draw with the, with the amber, they immediately saw, right, I can take what I do in real life and I can apply it in a different situation. And that helps me to interpret this information. And it was getting them to think about, well, if I see something, how do I take what's happening in real life, apply it to that and help me to understand something new? And for me, that's something, luckily, I went to a primary school where we actually learnt by doing. So I automatically do that. But being able to adapt that to different situations and look at, in this context, what works for them? What do they understand? In another context, it might be completely different. And making sure that you're adapting that to the situation that you're in. So I, I, mean, I love the example of the carriage. And I thought, yeah, that's a brilliant one probably use it one day, but it's that again, understanding where you're coming from and what people relate to immediately. And it's a great way to bring science alive. Hey, Vincent, All right, Nicola, with your level up, you get to interact with young women. 
how do you bring the sciences or STEM rather alive to your to your um, youthful charges? So, um, what I would say, um, and and for those just to give you a background level up, it is a it is it is a community that we develop to develop women all ages um, um, across the bank um, to to seek leadership. So we normally do have a technical, we usually have a technical um, session as part of our events every year. So last year we had a data, a fellow colleague, a data scientist based in Trinidad, a data practitioner, to kind of speak about her journey um, and, and the beauty of her journey. Um, I find that we all think something is unattainable, but she, she spoke on the journey of having failed to do doing an exam and this case was Tableau data analytics being certified as a um certified as someone that can sell it right so it goes beyond using she had to do a certification and she failed it twice or three times. So um one of the things I remember that um feedback from some ladies, young ladies um in particular was that failure is not a is not the end, right? Um, um, I would also say that the advice or what I I say is that there's so many there's so many resources out there, and there's no reason to limit yourself, right? So it's I find that sometimes you find that people are their own worst enemy, so you automatically assume oh, this is too hard or I I don't get it. Or, you know, so I always say kind of speak up, speak up for yourself. Um, the loudest person in the room is not the smartest person all the time. <laughs> and, you know, and just go for your gut instinct as well. <laughs> all right, great. Thank you. All right, so let's let's shift gears a little bit and let's uh, go and discover. The article uh, was placed in the nation um, this was back in 2018, and um, this was a this um, Senator McConney having a, a discussion at the time, and she said, "I'm suggesting that for Barbados to benefit from STEM promotion, it must build its STEM capacity at all levels." The National Science and Technology Summer Camp put in place by the NCST is one such program. It seeks to build awareness and understanding by young students of the value of s and science and technology in everyday life. My question, um, especially to the educators here, um, have we in the Caribbean, and Barbados in particular, been building out that STEM capacity at all levels? And Mr. Drace, I'm gonna let you take the first bite at the cherry. Um, thank you, sir. I, I don't believe, I, I, I can start with the end answer. And I don't believe that we have been fully concentrating on, on really giving all to our charges as it relates to the science, the technologies and so on throughout. And, and it, it has to do with the societal mindset to, to a large extent in terms of um, when we hear us speaking about the science and, and the passion and, and agriculture and so on, they, they are the, the those who are ingrained in saying to our young charges that come before us, you know, that's nothing to get into. They still have the mindset of lawyers and doctors and, and, and not understanding that well, we know before the engineers and so on, you are really not going to have any of those instruments or implements to operate with. And, and therefore, we have not created the enabling environment within the educational forum. My rhetorical question is where is it that on a national level, they're even offering TVET scholarships to encourage STEM. So if you are every year offering scholarships and exhibitions for the academics, all respect you, but understand, no, we are not focusing on those young persons to say, I am gonna to aspire to get one of those scholarships. There's still only those academic scholarships. We've only been asked and we have submitted through the Tibet Council in 2018 
a paper on how to go about structuring the TVET scholarship. This is 2023. So that's why it's getting strong. No, we have not started. And now that's our Honorable Minister of Education. So we hope to see more of a big charge in that light, in that context, sir, as it relates to starting from the junior schools. I will say it has started because we have started in the juice of robotics. I don't know if anyone here has been to the exhibition that was recently held by Miss at UWI. It was wonderful to see so many different versions of, of engineering. Um, so we are getting the, the, it actually filled the graduation tent at its school at UWI. And it was an excellent display to me of where we are going. We have been partnering with Professor Cardinal Ward. So SJPI is being strategic and, and working on getting just not just a summer program, but permanent programs in engineering and so on. So we have made small strides, but they are very small. There is a need more so than ever for the TVEC scholarship. Align it with the National Academic Scholarship and let we have our national TVEC scholarship as well. That is an impetus and a motivator. You're muted, sir. Doctor, sorry about that, guys. Dr. Durant, you are at the university. Um, from your perspective, are we building out that STEM capacity throughout our nation? Well, I would say, um, I would say not really. I mean, like science and you know, you know, what you say are the science is is normally seen as a hard subject. Science, you have to, there are certain rules, there are certain laws, there are certain things, and there are required answers. It is completely different from sociology, history, some of the other subjects where you can put your opinion and it is accepted. So students see, you know, science subject as hard subjects, difficult subjects where you really have to apply your mind. So it is all about how the subject is presented, that interactive, then you can get more students interested, but um, more of that has to be done, more interaction, more innovation in how this, this, the, the subject is presented so that those ones who shy away from the subject can see that this is something that once you learn the basics, it is something that can take you really far and you can be involved in many different aspects of science and it can be a rewarding and, you know, fulfilling um, career. Okay. So that, that's what I would say. So, Mr. Douglas, um, I can't let you get away from this one and I'm going to do an adjunct to that question. Um, in this journal that I had um, cited earlier, there's a section in there that says confidence in teaching science and mathematics. Teachers initially expressed some fear and uncertainty about not doing the right thing when they attempted to practice new approaches um, uh, for learnt, uh, learnt for integrating mathematics and science concepts into their teaching. They lack confidence to teach mathematics and science beyond topics traditionally taught. However, with support from mentors, teachers develop confidence to teach new concepts and skills and their competence improve. Where are we lacking, not only in our secondary, but certainly in our primary schools, at having those mentors and instilling that confidence so that we can approach these subjects, as Ms. Jurent just said, not that they are interpreted as being hard or difficult, but uh, that they can be fun, and that through having that fun that you're learning at the same thing. What, what are your thoughts as a teacher directly in the system, sir? Uh, we, we need to focus on science education um, in uh, at early childhood. Um, it, we really need to um, present information. I mean, I've said this before. We really need to be able to present the world and the way in which nature works to children at a very early age um, so that they develop a way of approaching existence and looking at the world that is scientifically driven so that moving into the secondary field um, um, 
and then doing um, more strict discipline in terms of science, um, in terms of integrated science, and then into the strict disciplines of biology, chemistry, uh, physics, um, as we go on is easier. I'm not saying that primary schools don't have science syllabuses, but um, certainly the way we've talked about this before today, the way in which these subjects are taught and the earlier they are taught builds a particular approach. Now, we know that everyone is not going to be interested in science. Um, and that is what um, makes up a, a, a rich society. But certainly, even those persons who do not pursue it as a career need to have a base appreciation and approach to it for the world. So I would say to you that um, there are efforts by the uh, Ministry of Education to um, increase STEM integration. We talked about, um, uh, Mr. Drake's talked about robotics and the showcase that we recently had. And um, recent um, uh, um, uh, implementation of um, digital literacy programs and coding, and well, the ill-fated coding, I think people would know what I may, may be referring to, but coding syllabuses in our first forms in secondary school indicate the ministry's intention to push a particular type of subject that brings with it a particular type of thought, right? So you can see STEM in those cases. I would say that we need to do it from earlier and then to, to speak about your adjunct. It is true, sir, that mathematics in particular is considered to be a difficult subject to teach. It is unfortunately easy to produce in a student a dislike for a subject. And I'm sure you would understand. Subjects that um, have a greater range of, of, of answer. I think Dr. Durant, Dr. Durant was talking about it just now, right? Where you, like, you know, in English, where you can essentially get to deliberate and express yourselves and so on. But mathematics is very precise. And when a student gets too many math questions wrong, that doesn't feel good. And it is amazing how early uh, in a child's life you can make a child feel very bad about a subject that they will then never want to make effort with again. Um, certainly, there needs to be maybe a greater emphasis on a particular type of mentorship, as has been said, right, or work with certain content experts. Um, uh, the identification of teachers at secondary and primary level who have a known track record of being able to convey information to students and teach them to be good mathematics students so that those become um, resource persons or master teachers that can then tutor and mentor um, teachers because the reality is that, believe me, as a math and science teacher at the secondary level, many of our students come in at first form with concepts and ideas that are anathema to the way in which um, mathematics is truly done. So those are real ideas. So yes, I would say to you that there certainly is a need for that type of mentorship and, and an understanding that there, there are unfortunate beginnings that then last children all through their life and push them away from STEM subjects. Um, and there it has been a push by the ministry to do certain things in our secondary system, but of course more can be done. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, so I'm coming that, out. Can I, can I pop it, um, follow up here with a comment as well? Because, okay. you know, I do agree with everything that was said about the ministry having to step up and everything. And to your point, I remember, and I, and I guess it's still some prestige to say that you're a doctor, you know, well, my son is a doctor and, or, or a lawyer, right? Um, but I also think that it was on, on my generation and parents coming up to to realize where we're at. As I am so conscious now of the things we're going through with climate change. I'm not saying my son said he wants to be a lawyer. No, 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 no. This is not being an engineer. What was something where you could really, you know, but. I think the parents also have a responsibility not to want to cry down and to, to be more cognizant of what we try to funnel our children in certain paths as well, right? I, I'm so mindful of it now because I always keep thinking about the future, the future of Barbados that I'm leaving for my son. And, you know, so I just want to say that because I don't think the government will do everything. I, I don't think they can. Um, I think about private sector, if they are stepping up enough, I personally don't think so. Um, <laughs> but I also think that I have a, a responsibility then to make sure that I support and, and not say is a doctor or a lawyer 
is the only profession. I, I know no shade to lawyers, my, my sister is one, but it's not the only profession out there. Um, and it's not also about money, because I think money also drives so why people shut away from certain certain uh, fields as well. Okay, thanks for that. And my next question is actually going to be um, toward yourself and um, Dr. Abasa. And this is taken, um, this is a paper on STEM and TVET in the Caribbean, Mr. Dritz. I'm not sure if you know this paper, but I'll certainly share it with you. Uh, it's written by Raymond Dixon and Disraeli Hutton. And they said, professional practices in many workplaces and research settings have been transformed to emphasize multidisciplinary enterprises, such as biomedical engineering. Also, professional scientists and engineers in the vast interconnected enterprise of companies academic institutions and government laboratories that conduct research and develop new products and services almost always work in ways that integrate the disciplines of STEM. So from the, um, Nicola, you are obviously in industry. Um, Dr. Dazi, you work um, in industry, you work in academia. How how have you, what's been your experience like in industry in, in working with multidisciplinary teams? And how do you see um, having a STEM background um, as an advantage in that regard? So Nicola, I'll start with you and then we'll go to Dr. Dazi. I find, and this is thinking about my team, thinking about those I've interacted with, those that have a STEM background or those that um, work in that space, I see are very much log logical and critical thinkers. I, I, I don't know how to explain it, but um, it's something I look for, especially when we are um, interviewing um, young talent. Um, I, it's very important um, having that background. What I notice and what I say to everyone, um, as you know, my background is in data analytics. When someone comes to me interested in that, I tell them, you know, I want you, I want you know how to think logically, once you're creative in your thought process, we can, I can teach you math, I can teach you computer science. It is not that hard. I need you to be able to take that business mindset. If you're coming from, um, if you're, I'm working with someone that has a background in marketing and this happens, oh, I want to know data analytics. I want to be able to do segmentation. I kind of go with them, you just need to be able to take that business, take that know-how and be able and I can teach you data, I can teach you data visualiz visualization. It, it's, it blends, it blends. Um, you know, I, I see that, me firstly, I see that there is a merging of disciplines. Um, you, can't, you can't get away from STEM in any field that you're doing. Um, if I go as far as um, if I think about even doctors, when doctors want to get into understand the patterns that they're seeing, they have to have that background, right? Um, when we think about agriculture, um, you know, there, there's going to be a blend. So you really can't get away from it. I, and I do think it has to, you have to approach things thinking practical, thinking applied. Uh, and that's how it sticks, essentially. Abasa, over to you. So I think it has a bit more to do with how you're taught than just the your background or the subjects that you end up specialising in. So um, this is something that recently I look back to, I think is very, very lucky in the primary school I went to. We're encouraged in the home I grew up in. We're encouraged to ask questions. We're encouraged to learn by doing. We weren't just told things. You actually went out and did it. In some of our classroom uh, exercises were actually leaving the classroom and going on a field trip and experiencing what it was we're supposed to have learned in class. And that probably had a lot to do with me going into the sciences and learning to explore and wanting to figure out how things worked. And I think if you take that approach, regardless what subject you're doing, learning how to be inquiring so you don't just take somebody saying something to you actually double check to see if that works now where um having a science background helps is actually the discipline that you go through in terms of carrying out experiments having to go back and check your work having to make sure that 
the results you're getting are actually correct helps to instill that discipline and so you do find that people in sciences and engineering tend to take that approach but that's more to do with the way the subjects are taught that doesn't stop that being done everywhere else you really want to make sure that in teaching you're encouraging students to be inquiring they shouldn't just take whatever it is you're saying they should ask questions they should confirm that knowledge and having that from different perspectives so then having multidisciplinary groups coming together means that you're getting people with inquiring minds who have learned to question things but they do it from a different point of view and that's when you actually get quite rich interaction see everybody being inquiring but coming from it coming at it from a science background coming at it from an architectural background coming at it from English coming at it from history means that you can be taking the same subject where you're going to get different perspectives on that and everybody actually learns a lot more and that's what I find is the most enriching part about having to work in interdisciplinary groups um, and a lot of the work I've done I actually didn't have a choice about being in interdisciplinary groups because you could only get funding for it by proving that you weren't all coming from the same background so it meant that we were having to work with different people and one of the things we learned there was you really needed to ask questions because um, seemingly we're all speaking English but a lot of the time we're speaking completely different languages so it's making sure that you learn that approach of asking questions double checking that your interpretation actually matches what you're seeing and what you're seeing actually matches the next person's interpretation and that there is where you're starting to get people learn the, um, the value in the question you get from a STEM background. Okay. Now, my last question to round off this section, guys, because just to let persons who might have joined late, um, just to remind you of our format, uh, we would have had um, a panel discussion. And after this, we are going to be entertaining questions to the panel. So I have seen a hand raise, and it's not that I'm ignoring you, Lisa. Uh, it's just that we want to get through this part first, and then we're going to uh, allow you guys to engage directly with our panel. Uh, that's what was set out at the beginning. So I do see you, and you will get that opportunity to ask that question very shortly. So my last question to the panelists before we open up for general questions. How important in today's world is critical thinking, and is there a dearth in that regard? So I'm going to start with you, Claire. Well, what I would say is people, uh, we always use this term critically thinking and person should be taught how to critically think. Um, critical thinking comes from, you know, exploring, being presented with different types of situations. So Teaching critical thinking has a lot of aspects, you know, associated with it, because the student themselves, you know, as a, you know, as a, as a primary school, as a secondary, as a university, or even at our, you know, age, it is critical thinking is using different information, you know, being presented with different situations, and then trying to come up with what is the most you know, like logical conclusion. And doing that for our youth requires, you know, all of what we have been discussing here today, presenting information, hands-on, you know, trying new stuff, and then being guided so that you can come up with what is the most logical um, result. So um, certainly, yes, you know, it's something that is very, you know, important. So that's a very nice and sanitized answer from you, Dr. Jure, and I appreciate that. So I, I, I got to go down the trenches since you want to stay in the very caution. I'm going to speak to Mr. Drakes. And Mr. Drakes, tell me about the importance of critical attention. Are our young people utilizing critical thinking? What, what are you seeing from your side, sir? I, I have a different thought. You ask that there's a dearth. And I would say to you, no. And, I, and you said go in the trenches. And my thoughts go to, and you see, we, we like to label and account with these fancy terms. But the guy who survives in the streets and we are calling him street wise, isn't he thinking critically? Mm -hmm. That survives and become a Jay-Z, yes. isn't yes. he thinking critically? How could there be a dearth? 
when there was other guys who we and we had to go in there was jungles and try to survive don't have the rare fall and in there no no at all to even survive overnight and they have taken all of what is as um was said by abba recently that you use what you have and you are smarter and wiser than that guy from harvard where is the death <laughs> so no more there's none and the critical thinking is used but we just don't use that term oh he's street smart and bobby is saying it says i'm one smart you say he's a trickster but we admire the american guy who's on the street selling kool-aid and say well that's good and bobby is not the one start time with the child law and you can't be working at that age and selling but even say those guys are entrepreneurs in the usa mm -hmm. so i am saying we label things sometimes in my view incorrectly where persons are critically thinking and solving serious problems in their world that help them to survive and the new pan the pandemic has shown us because of, of that kind of thought um robin douglas said it in terms of the controversial statement and he said it's controversial it's not controversial is that some people were able to think be outside the box and not take the vaccine once upon a time, probably in 1960, everybody will have taken it. So is it there much critical thinking going on? Where is the dearth? I don't see the dearth, sir. That's yeah. my response. Fantastic. Nicola, <laughs> what are your thoughts? You have young people coming to you as interns and, and new starts. Do they have that ability to critically think? I think they do. I think some people may not use it as much as they do. <laughs> Um, to be fair, I think some people are not willing to to step out on a um, step out. That's the truth, and I and I love for those people that are that have that who are proactive and are innovative. I agree with uh, Miss with Mr. Drake about um, about that. So I don't think we have a shortage of critical thinkers, but I think we need more problem solvers. Okay. <laughs> Abasa, what's happening up in the UK? I actually would say there's not very much thinking going on at all, let alone critical thinking. In all the talking about it is actually critical. It's because people are lazy. Mm. It's um, things are done for them. Everybody, somebody else is thinking for them, so there's no need for it to happen. So, um, it is a bit of a nanny state. So. People expect things to be done for them. People expect things to happen and kind of get a bit lost when it doesn't happen. So to give a very simple example, um, this is, um, uh, I was working as a ward in as a postgrad at university, basically because I needed money to live. And there was one day we were asked to go in to clean a room because of, during the holidays, the rooms were being let to investors to make money. And that's what happens in Edinburgh throw the students out and all the tourists come in and get cheaper accommodation. And basically we couldn't enter the room. We had to basically start with bin bags. I think there were five or six of us from the door to try to clear the pile of rubbish in there. And after that, we said to them, we would never ever do that again. That was insane. I mean, we're basically pulling out moldy food and it was, it was, it was a tip. And later on, we speak to somebody and we find explanation for why I get in situations like that. We had to do it because the cleaners refused to do it. And then we said, then next time, we don't care. We will never, ever do something like that. We weren't being paid until it's going to be like, have to clean up that. And it turned out one of the kids said that he didn't really understand what was going on. When he was at home, he would go away to school, come back, and his room was tidy. And he'd throw stuff all over the place, go away to school the next day, come back and his room was tidy. So when he went to university, he did the same thing. But strangely, when he came back from lectures, his room wasn't tidy. And it was a thing of because he didn't have to make that connection from at home, his mother, and I'm not being sexist here, it was his mother, was cleaning his room for him all the time. And he thought by some magical something when you went away to school in the morning when you came back the place had tidied itself up so he went away to university and didn't get why his room wasn't tidying itself up 
Because this, this is an example of how lazy they were. And you're thinking, I don't know how you got into university if you haven't found the answer to that. And these are the people that are being built because everything is being done for them. And they've got all these opportunities that are being completely wasted, but he'll go away and get a good job because he looks right, you know, and he's got a university degree, but basic critical thinking to understand why his room didn't self-clean, much as I would love to have a self-cleaning home, just that that gap, it was, it was, it was quite surprising. He really seriously did not get that gap. And you're getting too many of those because things are being done for them. Whereas the kid coming from a home where they've not got disposable income, their mother hasn't got time to go clean up the mess. So they will learn how you go from, if I throw rubbish, I need to pick it up where it stays where it is. And yeah, so it's, it, it really is that developing it and um, people learning the hard way, how to get to start to think critically. Okay. Oh. Uh, Miss, I almost call you Dr. Douglas. You don't get there yet. Mr. Douglas, you are at a secondary school. So tell us about um, critical thinking and, and what your perspectives are as it pertains to our students today. No, I am not convinced whatsoever. And I say that to mean that I see quite, um, I don't even know if to call it a dearth, I see a chasm of critical thought. I'm going to explain. Um, I will, I'm going to agree with uh, um, Abatha, is that, is that the correct pronounce, the pronunciation? People are very, students are very lazy, but there's a reason for this. The reality about human nature is that no one wants to do the, anything that is hard. Um, and pleasure is what we seek. Um, we eat food for pleasure. We do many things for pleasure. Um, and we live in a world where much of what we, we would have had to have done on our own in past times as persons of the age that we are is done for students because they have a cell phone that has access to Google um, or um, YouTube, YouTube diversity and all the rest of it. There is a considerable lot less um, need to explore, discover and learn. And, and it's not just learning the thing that you discovered, but learning how to think in that way and, and, and navigate life in that way. It's like the term that says necessity is the mother of invention. If there is no need, then why would you even do it? And so what I find is two things. I find that um, our students are often too lazy to think. And because they are, well, uh, because they have been that way for so long, they have not developed, sufficiently developed the habit of critical thought. That has been my experience. Now, I, I come from a perspective of teaching mathematics because, I mean, I'm an insane principal who decided that I still wanted to teach in the classroom. And um, I have math students who excel at one fifth form topic when it is extremely straightforward. But tell me straight, I hate this topic when, I mean, the example is... Um, matrices a fifth form topic where a lot of the work is just the application of arithmetic operations addition subtraction multiplication right to matrices you know so the you know braided um numbers and so on but then if we have to do something like circle theorem that requires the students to have a, a an essentially a database of rules right line and angle rules and various theorems with circles and how things, lines and angles combine inside circles and then be given um, a combination of them and have to sit down and figure out, okay, which ones apply? Can I see it? Can I turn the page? And they don't want to do that. And so, as I said, it's twofold. It's about not wanting to think. And then the disadvantage of that is, is then when they are required to think, they haven't had the practice. They're not accustomed to approaching things. I must admit, I really dislike the term outside the box. I think it's used way too often. But creative thinking, new ways of thinking. Someone, I remember when Mr. Drake said earlier, he talked about steam and art. I do agree that some of the best scientists are the creative ones, the ones that have wild ideas about how to ap apply the stuff, but they still know the stuff and can apply. So. Getting back to it, I am not convinced that there is sufficient critical thought. And I think that this is an unfortunate result of the world that we currently live in, 
what it does is it provides a, 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 an intense challenge to both parents and educators to modify the kind of exposure to the ease of, of, of solutions for their children. I have been advocating with many of my with my parent body, and I continue to do so, that allowing our developed developing brains of our of our teenagers to have access to cell phones, mobile um, um, supercomputers that they can go to bed with and do whatever they want with, right, in the confines of their room or in their private spaces, unfettered um, exposure to that is not good for their minds. Give them half an hour or an hour a night and then we, um, um, take back the phone. And the same thing with teachers. We are in a space where, yes, cell phones are amazing devices for us to be able to use as teaching tools. We certainly we do. But then um, how do we monitor and, and adjust that for all the other things that students will want to do with the ability to have information at the ready? So I've been rambling on. You get my point. I am very concerned about not thinking because the world produces so many answers for them, right? And the kind of lack of practice uh, of deeper and more um, um, exploratory type of thought that that brings with it. And often when you have to then indulge in things like uh, analyses and interpretation, when you do labs and, and experiments and so on, and students are presented with lots of bits and pieces of information and they have to figure it out and put it together, they struggle. And this is where teachers then have to spend time teaching them the, the, the habit of a particular type of thought. This is my concern. Great. And you have wonderfully opened the can of worms for persons to come in and start to ask some questions now. So guys, we are at this stage where we are going to open up the forum to our audience to be able to engage with you as panelists. And I know Lisa Ruck has had her hand up forever. So Lisa, I'm coming straight to you to ask your, for your question. Uh, please proceed. You can unmute and proceed. Hello. Hello. Hi, how panel. You? How are you? <laughs> um, I, I didn't actually have a question. I have interventions. So um, <laughs> I, I'd like to make an intervention here um, as an educator. Um, you know, we've been discussing the state of STEM education here in Barbados. And I come from a background of primary education. Uh, higher education, higher learning, teacher training, corporate training, um, having started as a primary teacher, primary school teacher here in Barbados, and then I moved to, abroad to Italy, been there for like 11, 12 years, teaching at university. And my journey transitioned, I transitioned into instructional design. And that's where I want to come at from that perspective, because we're talking about teachers and curriculum and we're going all around something that's really missing. And that's learning design. And it's at the core of everything you're talking about here. So, you know, I'd like to provide some insights for for how learning designers can create effective and innovative approaches to STEM. And that I keep hearing that and I'm like, that's that's the missing link here. Um, I think that we can agree that traditional approaches to STEM education are not sufficient here in Barbados in preparing students, you know, for, you know, this complex and very rapidly changing demands of, of the modern workforce. And curriculum, our curriculum needs to be updated. Um, we're talking about curriculum and we're talking about the teachers, but you're missing the learning designers. And more instructional designers need to be established in the educational system because they are the ones who focus on aligning the curriculum and the subject matter experts and the subject that will be then, that would you know, incorporate technology and promote critical thinking and problem solving skills and engage students in the hands-on experiences. The learning designers are the ones that collaborate between the educators, the researchers, the industry partners, the subject matter experts to determine what do what do the teachers struggle with? What does the industry need? What are the students missing? And instructional designers, learning de designers are the ones that bring that together. They also plan the training programs for the teachers. And you mentioned that teachers were talking about how they were fearful and unsure about how to broach certain topics. So we've got all these separate 
um, parts that kind of need to be brought together with that missing key in, in the STEM education. They're the ones that would de develop, you know, new, new learning materials and teaching materials on both sides. So, you know, Robin spoke about the fact, <laughs> Robin, he spoke about the fact that teachers are overwhelmed with deadlines and meeting curriculum. Uh, but as a result of this, there isn't much room for explorative teaching or learning. And Mr. Jones, you posed the question to the panel, how do we adjust our teaching style? Well, my view is that teachers need to be give, retrained and given the tools. That is the mandate of the Erdiston Teachers Training College. And we are underutilizing Erdiston. Erdiston still has the same programs being taught as when I left the teaching service in 2011. The same. And you have teachers being chosen to go into the teaching service a week, one day before they're meant to report to, to, to the classroom without any training whatsoever. And you very much have to rely on mentors and teachers that were there before you. That is great. But what is happening there is that we keep perpetuating a teaching style because they're gonna teach you to teach how they've been teaching. And this is where we need instructional designers to come in. We need the Erdiston and the Ministry of Education and SJPI and UWE. UWE has a new program, master's program on instructional design. We need those entities working together on redesigning our curriculum, moving our curriculum towards blended learning um, so that it really it 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 eases up, it, it changes the classroom dynamic to flip classroom where students can rely on going online on a learning management system where we would build out the core curriculum for them to explore. And then in the classroom is where there's the explorative learning. That is where there's the hands-on experience. So there's no more teaching for the sake of teaching. I can remember just at Common Mirror, just writing notes and notes and notes. I hated science. It was the most, all three of them were the most boring subjects I ever did. Why? Because it was just getting that information. It was all of it was in, information and hardly any exploration. And it's not that the teachers don't have the capability to do interesting and fun lessons. I can tell you as an educator, like, like Mr. Douglas said, we are just overwhelmed with all these deadlines that we have to meet. And so I think that for me, the recommendations that I would have for the future of STEM education is including the exploration of new teaching and learning models and the development of, of effective teacher and professional development programs and the evaluation of the effectiveness of different instruction design strategies. So from my perspective as an instructional designer and as a teacher trainer, I would say, because I've been, I've been training uh, teachers in Italy for years now, and I would say that the, the you know, core to what we are doing, we need to look at curriculum redevelopment, redeveloping the curriculum for blended learning, adopting the flipped classroom approach, um, establishing an LMS where we have the core curriculum online and students will go online on Moodle and get grades for the same as they would lie down watch YouTube, they lie down watch their classes and their lessons and then they come into the classroom and they have that hands-on interactive approach. If we establish this, there's more room for exploration and application. And then teacher training. We need to research these methods and then that's the place for Erdiston. You have teachers come in and teach. I thought, I remember having to teach myself subjects because I didn't know, because you just get hired in service. It's not like, in, in fact, well, in secondary, you would hire a mass teacher, but usually in primary, you teach everything. So you have to teach yourself. You have to rely on teachers that come before you. I think that we need to not only build out lessons and teach um, methods to teachers, but we also need to model these different teaching approaches to teachers. And that is where I think all of these entities need to start working together. Because I can tell you as a person who left Barbados and came, came back, I feel that we are, are so, so, we're so much at the same place where I left it. We're still talking about what we wanna do and we're struggling to actually do it. Okay.
you know. Right. And, sorry, um, your, your passion is infected, but I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to just stick a pin there so I can get a couple of questions in because our time is quickly coming up. No worries. But, uh, I think what you said is um, pretty much in line with what I'm thinking, but this is me from outside the education system looking in and wondering that like you said why it seems that so much people know what the answer is, but nothing seems to be happening. So I'll come back and speak to the educators, but I want to get to another person to ask some questions. So thanks very much. Ms. No Robert. worries. Thanks Amen. for your time. Um, Rivellino, um, I have your hand up and I got a message earlier about um, an exciting um, initiative that you have going on with artificial intelligence. Um, so can you give us from the industrial perspective, the person who is out there utilizing STEM um, involved in a project here and on continental Africa, what, what's, what's happening with STEM, what's happening with you? And do you see a future for that in Barbados and your region? There's a future, but we're way off course. I mean, we're, we're, we're looking in the wrong direction. We're doing the wrong things. I mean, we're thinking about um, schools and implementing in school, but we got to look for the low hanging fruit because I'll give you an example. There were some youngsters I met a year ago or two years ago in Barbados, and they were creating video games from home. But there was no opportunities in Barbados, so they had to go online and look for opportunities. And these were youngsters going to school that were working, developing video games. There are a ton of people out there that want to do stuff, but the opportunities aren't here. And there's no like innovation hub. People come together and you work on anything. I got lucky. I have a project. Um, I currently am part owner of the only free-to-air sports channel in Africa. We currently have the NBA rights for 40 countries across Africa. And I got that because we developed some software that distributes signals that replaces satellites with a one-second delay. We have boxes in Nigeria. We just implemented in Ghana yesterday at GTV. We were, we're, we're you know, doing stuff all through Africa. We're supposed to be there next week working with mobile providers for other softwares that we've developed. And we've been doing this directly out of Barbados. Um, we're just looking at it totally wrong. And there's so many people I meet with ideas and that have, but they have no opportunities, nowhere to, look, nowhere to go. I know youngsters that were working with, Bajans that were working with um, Instagram. They've now gone off with a Bloomberg. And guess what Bloomberg comes out with today? Chat, I mean, Bloomberg GPT came out. Seven billion tokens of information that they had within, within this using AI. And AI is where, we where everything is changing. And we're not, we're not seeing where the world is going and tailoring to suit. For example, we're talking about teaching coding when it's more about the critical thinking now because you have an AI software that's doing a lot of coding for you. It may be understanding the principles and being able to work with it and use that tool to its maximum. For example, animation. We're talking about doing animation now. And I saw something come out this week where they're using AI to create animation of whole worlds and everything else. The thing is changing so fast. You have to keep on top of the cutting edge to be there. When I was going to school, I had nothing to do with computer science. It was the most boring thing in the world. I had nothing to do with the sciences. I wasn't interested. I actually went, when it said STEAM, I, I found that quite funny because I'm involved in television. And I would see things and have ideas and then pull together a team of developers on people that I know could pull together a project and do the project. And now to have a project, I span Europe, Africa, wherever else. We're doing another project now. I fly on Sunday, then I'm going to Nigeria and we're implementing a few other projects. We have three softwares. We have a prototype of hardware. We, our hardware started with a Raspberry Pi and we showed them how this could actually work. They say, you can get something a little sleeker. We got something out of China and we put some firmware on it until we built something. We just built something totally new recently. And the gist of the system is we can put down a box in each individual TV station in Africa. We could put a live show going through and what we can do is on each box, replace the commercial. So for example, in Barbados, in Trinidad, they would have seen a RBTT commercial. In Barbados, they would have seen a first Caribbean in the first break. 
in Trinidad, I mean, in Grenada, they would have seen something different. That maximizes the revenue made. That's why we got pulled into this project, with what we were developing around broadcast tools. And that's how we got into it. But I see that we can do so much here, but we needed like an innovation hub and all the youngsters that are home coding, making their games and doing whatever, bring them in. Look at the low hanging fruit. There are youngsters in schools that are doing so much and they already know what they want to do. So don't fool yourself that they're all lazy. It may be one out of the 20 or whatever, but we need to find them and pull them together because again, disillusion and they leave in Barbados. I know so many, I know so many youngsters are doing so many things across the globe. I know one guy, he went UE and had to do computer studies. All he wanted to do is animation. I managed to get him back for the Miss Science and Things Festival here. Right now he's done animation for Disney, Warner Brothers, all of them. All the Netflix shows that just came out inside job, he was involved. I remember the days I was picking him up from UE to come home to, to great intros for sure. And he couldn't get anything related to that. He, he had to leave and go to Canada. But now he's coming back looking to train people in animation because he wants to build a team of 30 of his own so he can start doing animation. It's about the opportunities and seeing the opportunities and going after them and how animation and those things are changing. You've got to keep on top of it. Otherwise, we're going to be teaching things that are irrelevant. Okay. But I, again, I hear your passion, Rivalino, and I thank you for your intervention. So that that that's the passion coming through from both yourself and Ms. Rupp. So Mr. Drakes, you are probably um, what I like to term a, a disruptor in terms of local education because you, um, strangely enough, seem to actually get things done. So I've had, we've had persons saying there needs to be changes in our system, the way we approach things, the way we do things, the way we approach our, our, our science technolo uh, technology um mathematics and, and engineering subjects. How have you been able to do some of the stuff that you've been doing up at the um, SJPA? And what are your thoughts pertaining to what Lisa would have said earlier and what Rivalino would have just mentioned about the system, as it were, reacting to the needs of industry and society? Um, let me say um, to correct Lisa, SJPA has two appointed instructional designers. All that. We are not missing anything. We have the complete circles. And that would answer Vincent's question as well. How are you able to get things done? When the pandemic hit us, SJPA went into the full mode. There was much resistance in terms of blended teaching, not learning. And we just had to go to full mode because all 96 instructors are armed with the requisite tools and needed on-site training, remote training. We, we just continue and we never stopped. And, and, and it's because we were always planning that when we changed our name in 2017, it was deliberate, an institute of technology. And therefore we started to arm we have transformed and modernized some of our classrooms to smart classrooms where students and instructors go in and interact with the um, fancy boards, smart boards, and so on. So we have been delivering in our open and flexible learning center, both blended face-to-face, -face, and we used to go as far as Martinique. We are now starting the court, Sable was here last week. So we have expanded beyond Barbados. Um, I, I hear uh, the aspect of missing what opportunities, but I train differently. Barbados is only 166 square miles and that will never change. And I say we have the best resource in the world, people. So really my aim is to train for persons to either go in their bathroom, bedrooms, living rooms and, and work for those in China. And, and that's our approach. So opportunities are, are being presented to them and we are doing a lot of conversations and MOUs with Canada to get students to understand that you can work from in your living room or dining room for the persons in China. Animation is big. I remember um, my colleague in Baima did training about 30 something persons and they were all snatched up in quick time. 
The problem we have is that people have the traditional mindset and use the term brain drain. But we do not have enough space for the engineers that we can produce. So therefore, our approach is slightly different at the SJPI. And I call it the invisible foreign exchange when we encourage them to sit in their living rooms and dining rooms and be paid in US dollars for whatever they're doing. So that the opportunity, sometimes you don't have to physically leave anymore. And, and that is the approach that SJPI has been taking. What I would want to agree with um, Nicola on is that we need to get more private sector involvement. However, I am seeing a wonderful turn, Mr. Jones, as it relates to that. I'm seeing a lot of correspondence from private sector now saying, we want to engage your youth. And we even saying we are going to make sure that they are compensated and not using the old adage of, well, you know, they're coming to learn a trade and, and get the hands-on experiential situation and therefore we're not going to offer them anything. So I am seeing even from the private sector a, a different approach now with us being in, I call it the post-COVID situation. And, and so that's SJPI, instructional designers on a full-time basis, really showing those who used to do chalk and talk, this is how this can be transformed. However, I think the biggest obstacle is that something you have for lack of better term, those dinosaurs that are still in the classroom and they really fear the technology more so than anything else. And it's because they fear the digital citizens that's coming in front of them are making them look like digital migrants. And therefore they, they still want to be the sage on stage and not the facilitators and the guides for the citizens that are coming to them. And I think that's a bigger challenge that we are seeing at the SJPI. Thanks, Ian. Now, um, Dr. Dazzy has to jump off here. You guys would appreciate it. It's now after one in the UK. So, Abbas, I want to give you an opportunity as, as a digital uh, citizen, because I know you, you, you live in the UK, but you have done work outside uh, around Europe. I think you told me once as far as Japan and wherever else. So give us some insight into that, and then um, we will bid you a good night. So. Um... So uh, well, I think I've, I've had I've had the advantage of having worked in different places. Um, I've worked in, in different countries, uh, different backgrounds, and I've worked in industry. I've worked in academia. Um, one of the things, and I agree with the point about in um, not all students are lazy. A lot of them are. I we agree with uh, Google is probably the biggest problem we have at the moment because it's a um, that Google has given all the answers. Chat GPT is actually something that lots of people are scared about because it's going to be even more so than Google. So the innovators we have had in the past have made it a lot better for everybody in building infrastructure that you can work with, but it's also provided this advantage in that it's made things so easy that if people don't apply themselves, they just basically go just ride on the wave and the danger is that we're going to move backwards so being able to build the skill of critical thinking I think is really really important doesn't matter whether they're STEM or whatever they are it's that building the skill and getting them to practice it so that they use it and I think that's probably one of the most important things and um, I think for myself and that I'm getting from the, the panel here and from the audience even talking it's something that is critical and it's worldwide. It doesn't matter whether you're developing or you're super developed or whatever you are. Without that, things aren't going to continue to progress. And it's getting that and getting perspectives from different places. So it shouldn't be just the people who've got the opportunities and got the money who are doing everything. You're also looking at the people who would not necessarily have direct opportunity, uh, direct access to these opportunities, but he have got the brains and they've got the creativity, they've got the innovation and they have the attitude to develop and can bring that to the table as well. So it's making sure that we are actually widening access, not just by having policies that are supposed to do, but actually making sure that we're actually identifying these people the ones who want to learn, the ones who don't just want, if you want to ride the wave, be my guest, do it. But it's actually being able to identify the ones who 
do you want to learn critical thinking? Do you want to go in and develop that science, move it to the next level and bring these people together from different places, from different, different, different um, disciplines, different parts of the world, in, because that is actually where you're going to get things that really work. And I think that's really, really important. It's having that voice and that can push through. And yeah, that's, I think, basically one of the core things for me. And it's really great to speak in and, and listen to other people as well and get these different perspectives that I actively seek all the time. So it's been really great taking part in this panel. Dr. Abasa Dazi, I really appreciate, as I said earlier, you being able to join us tonight. Um, we look forward that this will not just be a one-off, that we'll be able to engage you again in the future. Hopefully when the time zones are a little bit um, nicer or at an earlier time. Um, but I am happy that you were able to come on tonight and um, engage with us. So thank you. And I bid you a good night and a happy Easter as we come down the finishing line on our end. So a good night to you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. So Nicola, um, interesting comments were made. Number one, innovation hub. Number two, the need for corporate Barbados to step up to the plate. So you are in corporate Barbados, um, a, a large financial entity. How do we get these large entities apart from just receiving people's money and banking it overseas from investing in this region and creating these innovation hubs so that STEM subjects can have that opportunity to emerge and give persons who are differently minded that they may not uh, 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 succeed in a, cl a typical classroom setting, not because they can't, but perhaps because they are bored and they need a different av avenue. So how, how, how do we encourage our private sector to come to the table as opposed to waiting to be invited? Mm -hmm. What I would say, um, first of all, is their social responsibility. I, I, I don't see um, why, why we're not taking them to task, right? right? They need to support, especially those that are very much, I don't want to say local to Barbados, but you know, you're contributing to the, the environment, you're contributing to the, the social and economic climate here, um, you should be training our, our minds. So, you know, as you said, I work at a, one of the banks here, and we do have that. We have the MOU with the University of the West Indies. Um, so, um, and, you know, for example, we brought in a cohort of data scientists from Trinidad, we have a rolling rotation every year that we bring them in to assist us in looking at opportunities with our data. So, you know, I would say you have to 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 really get them on that social responsibility, and and also look at um, applied learning. What I find with our there's a case for that. I I actually do find that. Having students and interns, the ones that um, perform better, I guess, when, when I think about it, are those that don't take the typical route. Um, so we've onboarded folks that um, currently doing the masters in data analytics at the University of West Indies. So you are having folks that may not have their first degree in computer science um, or math or IT and, you know, have this interest in data analytics. Um, I also think that there's a wealth of talent that some folks are not aware of. So we have to do more promoting. Um, I question, um, you know, I, I have hired as far as India and I've hired as far as Russia. And I've often wondered about, are we overlooking the quality of our talent in post? Do we do a good job of promoting? And I mean this from the educational institutions, because I don't go looking there. Sometimes it's not about cost, right? So I also think we have to do a, a better job of promoting ourselves and building those, those links. 
Okay, thanks very much for that, Nicola. So, Robin, Mr. Drake's obviously has, I dare put my neck on the chopping block here and say a level of flexibility at the SGAPI that perhaps the typical secondary principal might not have. Um, how, how do you see um, us being able to transform our secondary level approach to teaching STEM uh, within the remit that we have right now? Is it possible? With the effort of teachers are willing to put in that that effort to make that change, are persons quite happy to remain in the in the in the aisle or the lane that they've been assigned to? Uh, the persons who step outside that aisle get slapped down. What 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 is your observations and your thoughts, sir? I would say that um, there needs to be um, brave leadership. Maybe is the word I'm looking for. Um, yes, we're always constrained by resources, financial ones in particular. But I think that if um, uh, programs are clearly defined and presented and you can garner the, ne the necessary support, I think you would understand what I'm talking about. The support doesn't always have to be um, public service support. It doesn't always have to be something that would come from a budgetary proposal. Yes, but um, if you can do that, then you can gain the particular resources, that is the physical ones in terms of particular types of equipment, outfitting particular rooms with particular things, right? But we talked about, we didn't really talk about infrastructural stuff, but that's, I mean, that's some part of it. There are tools that we can acquire to help the kind of teaching we want to do. But the other part of it is about professional development. It is about um, having a sufficiently developed, uh, sufficiently worked out professional development program that will um, teach your teachers and guide your teachers in the type of teaching that you want them to do. Um, and it also means that you have to have a dedicated um, curriculum development team at your school who's going to sit down and work towards a particular goal. So there needs to be a certain type of leadership that will guide the teaching at the institution. Um, there are always constraints with these things, right? One of the constraints that we've talked about before, and I know that uh, we've talked about ways to get things done, and it's always about time. What one of the one of the least um, <laughs> abundant resources in a school year is time, um, and and making the necessary time to teach teachers what they need to know so that they can move in a particular direction. I think it can be done. I think with inspired leadership, it can occur. Um, there will always be uh, members of any movement that will be more comfortable to be where they are. But I think that most teachers I have encountered, I don't think, I have in experience myself that most teachers want the best for their students and become invested in the nation's movement um, um, in a particular way. And I think that most of the teachers that I have had the pleasure of working with are concerned with producing citizens that are the kind of citizens that we've been talking about that we want today. So if you, once you can do that, you could you should be able to move a team in a particular direction. I mean, I, I'd leave it there for now, understanding that, of course, there are always challenges, but I think it is definitely possible. Clear? You're not just a writer of textbooks for secondary school. You're very much a teacher. Um, what are your perspectives on this? And number one, is corporate Barbados stepping up to the plate? Number two, how do we change the mindset in the classroom to approach it differently? Well, what I would say is that, you know, for corporate Barbados, um, as Nicola said, it is, you know, to hold them to account and say, well, you know, you cannot escape your social responsibility in terms of, you know, supporting activities. You know, I would say, you know, for the two activities that I had, you know, at the university to encourage students, the beauty tattoos and technology, and then the one I had this year, chemistry, combustion, and um, uh, chemistry and combustion, um, I was able to put on those events because I won $10,000, 10,000 pounds each time to do those events. If I 
um, was rare pay for a corporate barbados to support me, they would never occur. You know, even though you ask for support, you know, the most that you could get donated is two pens and a cup because they do not see it as something that, you know, we should even put money, you know, we should put money into. So, uh, you know, corporate responsibility and social responsibility in terms of, you know, encouraging the young citizens, um, you know, is, is something that, you know, more people need to speak about, not just, um, you know, sponsoring, uh, you know, other types of, you know, other types of event. And all of that is to do with education. How is this related to my business and how, you know, this would be, you know, how this would be valuable. But I, I mean, like, there's a long way to go and we have made um, some progress. And we know that the Caribbean Examinations Council, they have their fixed curriculum and over the years they have tried to make some, you know, like adjustments to the syllabus, you know, adding in new topics and, you know, new, you know, new, um, new areas where, you know, students could learn and different stuff. So um, we are making progress, but we need, um, more persons to speak about this. We need to push, you know, from parents and principals to say, yes, we are making progress, but more needs to be done faster because the world is moving much faster now than it was moving before. Thank you so much. Mr. So, Jones, I, yes, I, I, wanna, I just want to add a 30 second to, to what Mr. Douglas said. Right and say, I do agree with Mr. Douglas. You just need brave principles. They have been a brave one who just retired, um, and, and Dr. David Brown. Dr. David Brown won the award in STEAM in terms of the TVET a few years ago. And yet people have the misconception that he is all about only the academics and the scholarships. That's a brave principle. It shows that he saw a place for STEM uh, even the, the pristine Queen's College. My daughter had to do catering and home economics for the graduation, but she won't go and buy a tech. And Dr. Brown said, you've got to get the exposure to steam. It just, as Mr. Douglas says sometimes, a brave principle. Stop using the excuse of being constrained. I am constrained, you know. I have to answer to the parent ministry, but let us get brave. And, and, and as I said to the corporate Barbados, gone are the days of giving me a golden handshake and a photo shoot. Um, Dr. Durant talked about a teacup and a, a, a cup, and you can't even give me a handshake and a photo up. You cannot bring that to my table. And you start by setting those standards, as Douglas said, you're brave. So you're saying, no, you don't get a handshake. What's in it for me? That's my two cents sir, on that. Okay, Mr. Drips, thank you so much. Now I've just got to offer persons one last opportunity to answer a question of our esteemed panel before we break tonight. Um, in addition, I want to ask please Ms. Ruck and Mr. Simmons, if you could um, send me contact details or contact the office to give the office your details, please. So is there anyone else that would like to ask a closing question before we go tonight? I don't want to sound like an auctioneer going once, going twice. Okay, guys, I want to really thank you for coming out tonight and engaging our public, um, Mr. Drakes, Nicola, Robin, Claire, and I will send message to Abba. I really want to thank you for agreeing to sit with us tonight and have a very candid discussion to some degree of what um, we face in Barbados pertaining to STEM. I think. For my part, I, I see it as a vehicle for this region to permit us to really compete globally. But I do think, um, as has been said, probably in different ways that we need to really approach our education in, in completely new ways for this new world that we are we are living and trying to thrive in. And I think the the rate at which our systems are able to transform and change to keep pace or to try to keep pace is just too slow and we have to stop thinking of what we don't have and what we can't do and what we can do with what we have so 
that those are my closing comments for tonight. And I really want to thank you guys. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I know everybody could have been doing something else on a Monday, Thursday, but I, I really want to thank you. And I really want to wish you guys a, a happy Easter. And thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you. And the thank same you so much. Thank You're you. You're most welcome. Okay. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Good night. Ladies Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, this will bring to the close tonight's session um, where we discuss STEM education in Barbados in the region. Uh, we have some exciting um, sessions coming up, uh, one maybe as soon as next week. So I ask you to please monitor uh, where you get your information from, the regular chats, the website, and so on. And uh, we'll be putting out some information in, in the next day or two with some exciting sessions that are coming. Um, we have, to, we're engaging a uh, technological startup, uh, ironically in Edinburgh, they're gonna do a, a, a presentation for us here. And we also have some visiting um, academics from, the, from Liverpool University who are interested in doing a presentation on a new energy technology, which I think is gonna be very exciting. So please do keep an eye out and uh, we hope to see you guys again. And remember, this is a CPD event. If you want to claim those CPD points for your professional designation, please reach out to Stacey at the office and she'll be happy then to hook you up with those two points. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been um, the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers we, uh, monthly webinar. And we just want to thank you for being a participant and participating in tonight's session. I bid you a happy Easter. Good night.